Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Pastor Daniel coming to you once again on this Promise LA page. I uh, just want to once again express my gratitude for all of you for joining me uh, week in and week out as we study God's Word. This is an exciting time for us uh, in so many ways. And uh, I just wanted to express my appreciation for all of you that have come and been a part uh, with this Promise LA page and uh, what we're doing here online. I've seen some of the feedback. I've, I've heard and uh, receive a lot of your messages and I just wanted to tell you thank you and uh, it's an encouragement to me as a uh, as a pastor and as a uh, um, as a servant of the Lord just to uh, to come and share God's Word and and, and to know that uh, it, it's it's having some effect with all of you uh, especially those uh, those of you in the in the city of Los Angeles, uh, but really all over the world. I didn't expect that when we first started this, and and here we are uh, a few years into this, into doing this online messaging, and uh, we're we're going to continue doing that even as we go live in the city of LA. I'm excited about that. Stay tuned for um, for some messages and some uh, announcements in regards to that. One including this Saturday as we do outreach. Uh, this coming Saturday, if you are in the downtown LA Pico Union City West area, we will be there and uh, we just want to come and meet the people, pray with you, uh, see what we can do with you and for you. And so uh, God bless you guys. I hope we get a chance to meet you out there. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to, to message me on this page and I'll be sure to react with you and uh, let you know whereabouts we are going to be and we will have announcements on this page as well. Well, if you've been following us over these last 12, 13 weeks now, you know we are at the end of uh, our, our exciting summer series, No Day Like Labor Day weekend to finish this series. And, uh, you know, we've had some delays and things of that nature. But uh, Labor Day weekend, we come to the close of, of Nehemiah chapter 13. And... Uh, if you know the story of Nehemiah chapter 13, or know the story of Nehemiah itself, many scholars, theologians, pastors such as myself, humorously say it would have been better off if Nehemiah stopped at chapter 12. Because if you were with us last week, you know that Nehemiah uh, set out to, to have this big elaborate event, a time of celebration, a time of dedication, right a time of where where they would reminisce and 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 recall all of god's favor all of god's provision all of all of god's blessings upon their lives as they finished this monumental task of not just completing the wall around jerusalem but establishing the city and so they went about to 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 dedicate the walls they they they, they brought all the levites and all the priesthood they, they, they gathered people who, who, who were in their right places, right? Anointed and appointed to lead in worship. They, 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 they purified themselves in the Lord. And they, and, and they rejoiced in all that God was doing. Because if you would know that the, the whole story of the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was called by God out of, out of Persia, of all places. Well, he was part of the exiles of, of Jerusalem, banished to uh, Babylon, which would eventually be Persia. And uh, here they were in, in exile, in prison, so to speak, in a land not their own. And, and, and Nehemiah hears word that his city, his people, are in trouble because the walls haven't been rebuilt. They were torn down. The gates weren't, were not hung. There was no security there was no consistency, therefore there was no refuge, no reputation for the city of Jerusalem, the city of God, amen. And so Nehemiah gets this vision to, to, to go from Persia back to Jerusalem to rebuild the wall, to, to, to go and fortify the city that the city may be rebuilt. And, and, and if you go through the, every step of, of all that we've studied all summer, you know that we, we study the book of Nehemiah that takes a dream into reality. See, a, a lot of us, including myself, 
we can go from saying, oh, God has given me this great and wonderful vision. Oh, God has given me this elaborate dream in which for me to, that's been on my heart, but something happened. Life happened. Tragedy might have happened. You know, uh, children happened. Jobs happened. Needs happened. And you never get to that place. Well, the whole book of Nehemiah is about just that. It's about going from God's concept to God's completion. It's going from being on your knees and praying about it to putting feet to your faith and being about it. And so all this summer we've been talking about what does it take to, to, to take your vision and bring it into reality, to bring it to a place of consummation. And we've been going through this all summer long, and I want to encourage you, because I cannot give you a recap of a summer series in one message. Amen. But, but it culminated last week when, when, when Nehemiah uh, did this huge event, this huge concert, public event, if you will, to, to commemorate, commemorate all that God had done. And, and, and like I said, it would have been cool if, if, if that's where it ended, where the people rejoiced. So much did they rejoice that the, that the towns and the cities around them, hell, they heard all the singing. They, they heard all the celebration. People knew what God had done in, in, in amongst the, his people and amongst his city. But we get to chapter 13. And chapter 13 is, all, is very different from chapter 12. Chapter 13, really, when you look at it, it's like, well, geez, did we really have to include this in the word? But there's something to be said about chapter 13, about how we view um, life's culmination, life's vision, how we view success. Again, this book of Nehemiah has been used as a platform to be used with different books, um, lessons about success, vision, leadership. But what is success? What's, what is success? Because we come to chapter 13, and there's a whole new role reversal in chapter 13. We come to chapter 13, and, and despite the fact that in previous chapters, mainly in chapter 10, where, where the people covenanted with God, means they made a promise, a covenant that shouldn't be broken, at least can't be broken, or it, it wasn't broken on one side, amen, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit. But, but they covenanted with God. They made a promise that, yes, God, we will follow you. Yes, God, we will, we will not intermarry with other pe people that are, are, uh, that are not of, of like faith. We, we, will, we will honor the Sabbath, and we will, we will not forsake the, 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 the priesthood, the, the Levites, we will, we will uh, have proper stewardship of, of all the offerings and all that's brought into the temple. And despite the fact that they covenanted with God, I, I think that's a word, right? Covenant, covenanting with God, they, they made this covenant with God. Yet you'll find in, in, in Nehemiah chapter 13, they went back to their old ways. They went, they went and did the, 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 and acted the way that their, their forefathers and generations before them acted. Even though they said way back in, in Nehemiah chapter 9 and, and Nehemiah chapter 8, they said, no, we need to have reform here. We need to go back to the, to the word of God. We need to, to get back into a relationship with God. Even though they did all that, they, they not only sealed the covenant, they signed the covenant, they promise God, they worship God, but because of all, even with because of all of that, they still went back to their old ways, and we're going to talk about that here in a little bit. And, and, and in, in, in Nehemiah chapter 6 and 7, Nehemiah says this, he says, But during all this, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. Then certain days after, I turned leave from the king, and I came to Jerusalem. You see, Nehemiah, just as he had promised, when, when he asked the king for leave, 
And he told Artaxerxes, I'm just going to go rebuild the wall and come right back. He did that. And he served the king. Even though, even though he, he built the wall and he could have made a name for himself. And he was in a place of leadership. And most likely people believe it's not like the king would have gone after him. Because first of all, he gave him permission. Second of all, he could have found another cupbearer. And it was too much of a big deal to try to go and all the way to Jerusalem to... Uh, to arrest Nehemiah and, and get him to come back. But even though he wasn't going to do all that, Nehemiah kept his word. There's something to be said about that type of leadership. Amen. And and Nehemiah goes back. And, 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 and history will tell us that he spent 10 to 12 years back at Persia. 10 to 12 years back at the citadel to serve King Artaxerxes because he gave him his word. And when he comes back, all of this what I have shared with you. All of these things of, of how they went back to their old ways is what he found. He found, he, 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 he found certain things. Um, you know, he, he found Tobiah. Tobiah, if you remember the story, Tobiah was one of the people that, that opposed um, Nehemiah when he came in to rebuild the wall. He, he threatened him. He, he, tried to, he tried to trick him. He tried to do certain things. That, that the wall would not be completed, right? He, he tried to do all these things to Nehemiah, and he found to, that man, Tobiah, was living in the storehouses in the temple. We're going to talk about that here in a little bit. We found that, that people were working on the Sabbath day. They didn't take the Sabbath rest. And, they let, and he found that, that just anybody was, was, they let anybody into the priesthood. You know, we talked about that last week, how meticulous it was for people to be amongst the priests and the Levites, those served in the temple. And so Nehemiah comes back and he probably thought, dang, all that for nothing. He, he probably thought that, oh man, I'm going to come back to Jerusalem and the city is going to be robust. The city, is, the people are going to be praising God. They're going to be worshipers of God. There's going to be revival. There's going to be people brought into, into the fold. He had great expectations because... I mean, after all, you have great expectations when you put your blood, sweat, and tears into something. Amen? But when he comes back, he finds completely the opposite. He comes back and, 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 and he, finds, he, he finds things that cause, maybe, maybe cause him to be a failure. Maybe it caused him to have doubts. Maybe I should have just stayed. Maybe I, should have, I shouldn't have went back. It's like, man, this, is, this isn't a success. This is a failure. And, you know, I want to share this with you because maybe there's many of you listening and you tried certain things. You, you tried looking at purpose and, you, and, and things didn't go the way you thought. You, you, you tried pursuing God's call for you and, and, and the results didn't pan out according to your expectations. You know, when... when when you lean into leadership, when you pursue your purpose, and when you chase after a call, there are going to be many times when your expectations will go unmet. There's going to be times when, when you will seem like an epic fail. Trust me, I know that. You know, you get around people who have great success today, and they'll tell you how many times they failed before they've actually reached success, consistent success in their lives. But what if I was to tell you that God sees success and failure so differently than you and I? God sees success not in results or, or performance, but he sees results according to his plan. Jim Cobray, one of the, uh, he's a retired pastor here in the, in the Southern California, he says this, success comes from following God the right way, meaning according to his plan. Amen. You, you see, here, here's the thing. We see, see, we see success as an end, where God sees success as part of the overall eternal picture. And so therefore, success would be defined differently than well, for God than it would be for us. Amen. As we peel back some of these things that you know, you'll see in, in, in chapter in chapter 13 that there's some expressions that Nehemiah make 
when he sees the condition of the city, when he sees what happened to all of his work, he makes what I call these expressives. There's some expressives that he makes. They're like they're like gut responses when he sees the results of all the the, the fruit of his labor. And, and as we talk about these expressives, we're, we're going to unpack and discover how God sees success. You want to join me in this in this word? It will change the way you see pursuing your calling. It'll change the way you chase after your purpose, you chase after your calling. It'll change the way you lean into your own leadership role of what God is calling you to do. So in Nehemiah chapter 13, let's dive in, shall we? Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you one, once again for this opportunity it is to get into your word, to study what it is that you have to say. We pray for your blessings. I pray once again that you would hide me behind the shadow of the cross, that your word, your, that your, that that you will increase and that I will decrease, and that your word will be preached and would fall on the fertile grounds of our hearts. Bless us, we pray, Lord. Let us have an encounter with you today. I pray, O oh Lord, that this word would 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 serve as an encouragement for all of those listening, for all of those that might have felt discouraged that it might even felt as if they failed. Bless this time, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. The first thing I want you to know, really quick, is success is not about the results, but it's about your faithfulness. It's not about the results of the work, but it's about your faithfulness. So you can res re leave the results to God. It's His work. Amen. We're just trying to be faithful to his calling. But I can understand how, how uh, uh, Nehemiah must feel. Because we come to Nehemiah chapter 13, and like I said, there's a priest by the name of Eliashim, who lets Tobiah, which is, uh, uh, I guess they were friends or even relatives, and he says, hey, Tobiah, come in. You can stay in the storehouse at the temple. You need a place to crash? Because uh, unfortunately... The rebuilding of the temple had an adverse effect on Tobiah as far as his authority, as far as his uh, influence on people, and as far probably even his finances, which is why he didn't want the wall to be built in the first place. And so Eliasa, maybe he had, he, he had uh, uh, compassion on Tobiah. Maybe he felt responsible because he was a priest and he was staying in the temple. But he tells Tobiah, hey, Tobiah, come and stay in the storehouse. Well, Nehemiah comes and he sees Tobiah there. And he recalls all that Tobiah had done. And he recalls that Tobiah was probably an Ammonite, or at the very least a Gentile. He was staying in the storehouse. You know what that means? It means the storehouse was supposed to be a place where, where they would store the sacrifices that were going to be made, the grain offering, some of the uh, provision for the Levites. We're supposed to be in the storehouse. And, and, and when the storehouse was not being used properly, that means it affected the ministry of the temple. That means the Levites who were working there was not, were not getting their provision. That means the sacrifices that were supposed to be made to God, they were actually tainted because, you know, they, they, they led a Gentile into the temple. And, and, and actually the Bible tells us in... Um, in verse 9, that, that uh, um, Nehemiah kicked out Tobiah. He evicted him, saying, get out of here. Hit the road, Jack. And he had, he had to cleanse the storehouse. Because that means the, it, when, the, when the offerings were no good, they were tainted, that means they didn't have any effect. It wasn't worship. It, it, it wasn't sacrifice. You know, and, and Nehemiah was, was, uh, was upset and he was mad because... They, that means these things were were, were taken uh, without reverence. They were non they, they were nonchalant. So much so that even some of the the Levites who were serving in the temple went back to the fields. They, they there were probably some that were pioneers that we said a couple weeks ago that needed to happen for the city to to be revitalized. 
they went back into the countryside. The, the Levites went back to the countryside and said, you know what, I can make a better living someplace else. And that's because the priests, the, 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 their stewardship of the temple that was, wasn't, wasn't correct. It was mishandled. And here they were, a people that, that covenanted with God, and they, said, and they said, you know what, we're just going to do it the way we think is right. And that's always been a problem. Is that when people do what is right in their own eyes and they don't see why God prescribed things the way he did. Maybe you feel that way today. Maybe you feel like the results aren't what it was supposed to be. Uh, in, in verse 14, one of the expressive that Nehemiah said, he says, Remember me, O oh my God, concerning this and do not wipe away, wipe out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and its services. It says, remember my good deeds, Lord. Don't, please don't let it go in vain. Please don't let it go to waste. I, I spent all this time out here, and these guys messed up. Please don't, 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 don't look upon this as a waste of time. Don't, don't let my work go in vain. You know, so we, we feel that way sometimes, amen, that our work has gone in vain. That we did all the sacrifices and the work for nothing. We don't see good results for all that we labored. We don't see the fruit of all our sacrifices, of all that we've worked for. You know, there's I know athletes that worked hard in the gym and worked in practice, but never met their expectations. I know students who, who, who studied day in and day out, but couldn't get to the next level like graduate school. You know, and they felt like failures, and they didn't know what to do. I know people who worked on their relationships for years and years, and, and the relationship finally came to an end. And, they, and they, say, they say to themselves, what did I do all that for? What, what good was all my sacrifices? What good was, was putting up with all this stuff? What, what good was, was, was working out when, when, when I didn't make the next level? What good was studying those days when and and, uh, and and it didn't it didn't work out the way I thought it was? What good was investing my time, talent, and treasure, and I have nothing to show for it? Well, in this world, it may seem that way. It may seem like a waste of time, a waste of energy, and a waste of years. But I want to tell you, not so with God. The Bible says in, 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 in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, it says, Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. Your labor for the Lord is not in vain. Our work may not yield the returns that we think. It may not show up in the results that we want or the expectations that we wanted but it does not mean that our work was done in vain I want to tell you whatever you do for the Lord whatever you do for the Lord God sees he honors and he is glorified in whatever you do just your simple act of obedience regardless of the results glorifies God he sees it he will honor it and he will bless it he will bless it. It will be a blessing to him, and it will be a blessing to you. Again, let me reiterate. Sometimes we, we see results in our own perception. We see, we see success as an end to our work, but God sees it as a piece to his, uh, to his overall eternal work. We're, we're a part of God's plan. We're, sometimes it's a plan that, that needs to connect with another plan. And, and that's why we don't see what we, we, what we think we want to see. You know, the Bible talks about in Hebrews that there are people who, uh, who, 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 uh, wait, who had uh, waited in faith but never saw it. They never saw it. They had faith, but they never saw the culmination of that. Why? Because it was still coming. It was still a piece. What they were part of was still a piece of God's eternal plan. There's a, there's a back in the Old Testament there was a minor prophet by the name we call him a minor prophet by the name of Jeremiah. He was called to the people of Israel uh, during right before they went into exile, and he's the one that kept warning people. 
you, you better. God told me that you need to repent. You need to turn back to him. Stop worshiping pagan, uh, pagan worship. Stop worshiping those idols. But they wouldn't repent. And Jeremiah, all the years, all the years that, that he served the Lord, not one person repented. And you'd think he, he would, his whole work might have went for nothing. But you know, years down the line, while Daniel was in, the prophet Daniel was in exile, he read Jeremiah's work. He knew of what Jeremiah did. We read in Jeremiah's work all in the Bible today. We learn from it. There's some things that we glean from it in our studies today. So was his work done in vain? Absolutely not. And neither will yours. No matter where you are in pursuing your in pursuing your purpose, into leaning into leadership or chasing your calling, your work is never done in vain. The next thing that we need to know is that is that success stands upon the greatness of God's mercy. Success stands on the greatness of God's mercy. Amen. In verse twenty two. It says, Remember me, O my God, concerning this also, and spare me according to the greatness of your mercy. It said, Spare me according to the greatness of your mercy. You know, in, in uh, I'm not, I, I won't be able to read it for time's sake, but, but in, uh, in verses 15 to 16, he found people working on the Sabbath day. He, they were trading donkeys and, and animals. They were they were uh, they were trading sacrifices. They were doing things that God had told them. Don't do this on the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day is holy. The Sabbath day is set apart. You know for you. Don't don't work and and uh, and Nehemiah tells him in in verse seventeen. He says, "What evil thing is this that you do by which you profane the Sabbath day?" You know, people probably looked at it and said, "What? I'm just working. I'm not stealing from anybody. I'm not hurting anybody. Why do you call it evil?" You know, it's, it's evil in the ways because they're they're taking things that are holy and treating them as they're common. You know, back in in Exodus chapter 16, when 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 Mo God and Moses were introducing the the people of Israel to to manna, they told them, "Don't go out there. This you, you're going to pick." For six days, pick all that you need. Every day, every Sunday, every every day for six days, you will you will pick for 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 all that you need. And on the sixth day, on the sixth day, you'll pick twice as much as you need, and you will have enough. And on the seventh day, don't 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 go out there because that's your rest. That's your rest day. That's a day set apart upon the Lord. But people started to go out there and they started to pick and they was like. Well, how come there's nothing out here? Well, because you're not supposed to go out there on the Sabbath day. It may not see, seem like a big deal, but the Sabbath day is supposed to be separated unto the Lord. It, it's it, it, it's like saying to, to to God, it's like, God, we, we know what you said, that we don't have to go out there, but but what if we run out? What, what if there isn't enough? Even though God told them it was, it was going to be enough. And, and, and when you don't trust God, you're violating, you're saying that his character is not true. And when you're saying his character is not true, you're saying that he's not a holy God. And you're taking things uh, that, are, that are holy and you're treating them as they are common. And you're saying, oh, that's okay, I can work. Oh, that's okay, I can trade on this day, even though it's a Sabbath day. And, and, and Nehemiah looked at this and he says, you're profaning this day. You don't even know what you're doing. You don't understand. You're not reverencing God. You're not taking time to, to, to say, God, this is your day alone. They're not, they're, they're not coming to this day with the right heart. They're not coming to this day with the right attitude and the right perception. No, and, and God says, look, I'm going to take care of all your needs. You just need to come to me and, and, and trust me. And believe in my character. Believe in who I tell you that I am. And treat me as I am holy. Because he is holy. How do we do that sometimes? 
do do we do we come nonchalantly when we come to a into the prayer room? Well, maybe when we come into His Word, you know, we don't treat it with reverence like we're coming to meet God and and say, Lord, I'm coming to have a conversation with you. I'm coming to fellowship with you. Do we come to worship and we say, Man, I just like that song, and you don't treat it as worship? Do we do that with in our work and in our homes? It's like, oh, it's okay. It's okay. I know we're, we're saved by grace. But just because we're saved by grace, it doesn't minimize the fact that he is still a holy God that's worthy of our, of our praise, that's worthy of our worship, that's worthy of our reverence towards him. To set time away for him. That, that we may spend time with his, him because he's a holy God. Oh, in about a week, we're going to spend time watching football. In about a week, we're going to spend some time getting there in our gatherings and, 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 and doing what we do in the fall. We're setting those times apart. But what about with the Holy God? The Bible says this, that uh, in, in, uh, in Ephesians 2.13, because of the cross, we have been brought near to this Holy God. In, 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 in 2 Corinthians um, chapter 4, verse 7 to 10, that we have this treasure, the Holy Spirit of God, this whole, the, 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 the Holy Spirit of God in earthen vessels, which is us, that, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not, not us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken cast down but not destroyed always bearing about the body always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life of Jesus might be made manifest in our body see that's what success is is, is because of his mercy on us because of because of him not not exacting uh, punishment which is what all of them who who have uh, profaned the Sabbath day, and all of us, because we've all sinned, because of all that, because of all that, we we are deserving of God's judgment. Because, but because of His mercy, He starts to use us. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. That even though this world around us should be should be should it troubles us, it distresses us, it it, it tries to it tries to break us, but we're but, but it doesn't break us because the power of God is in us. And he uses us that, that the life of Jesus may be manifest. That, 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 that says that, that the, the power that comes from putting your faith and your trust in the atoning work of the cross is real. And it's real in you and me. See, that's what success is. Success is not about us us uh, um, coming to a place where 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 we receive the fruits of of our labor, or 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 or, or meet the expectations of our of our purpose, but the success is found in glorifying the one who sent us and called us with a holy calling. Amen. That's what success is. It's not about what we think to ourselves and how we're supposed to look like, but but it's about. It's a, about glorifying the one who sent us in the first place. The last thing I want to share with you is that success acknowledging is acknowledges that God is good and is always good. In, in, the, in the last part of this whole chapter it says, Remember me, oh my God, for good. Despite all that's happened, and, and despite all, all, all that you see that might seem, that might seem like it is, it, it, it's a, it's a huge failure. Remember me for good. Remember me for good. You know everything that you go through, whether you feel like it's, it's, it's a failure or a disappointment. Remember that God is good. Psalm one nineteen verse six verse sixty eight. You are good, and you do good. Do you know that? That God is good, and he does good. Everything that he does is good. I like to tell people this, that God is good, and he does good, and he's doing something 
good in you even though it doesn't look like it. Amen. God is good and he does good and he's doing something good in you even if it doesn't look like it. I want to tell you, God is good. God is good. When, when you feel like, like, like your life is a failure, look for the goodness of God and you will find success. When you feel that your work is, is a huge disappointment, look for the goodness of God in it, and you will find success. If you feel like your relationships, your marriages, your all that you, you've, con you've committed your whole life to you is a big disappointment and a big failure, look for the goodness of God in it, and you will find success. God is good, and is does good. If you feel like a loser today, Know that God is good and that he does good. I want to finish this message and finish this series. You know, with all that Nehemiah went through. And what, what, what he went through, all the, all, you know, the opposition, all the threats, everything else. Was it a failure? Did he go through it for nothing? Think about the overall scope of this. Because at the end of, of uh, because Nehemiah really is the, uh, the last book in, in what we call the history books of Israel. That, that, that documents the nation of Israel before, before Jesus comes. Everything else is, you know, writings of poetry, the, the prophetic books, and everything else. But Nehemiah really is, other than Ezra, I'm sorry, um, it's the last history book. And so you could say, it's like, man, was it a fail? Shouldn't he have known? Like some people say, shouldn't he have known that Israel was going to go back to the way it was? They've done that for generation upon generation. Shouldn't Nehemiah have known that, that if he left, that uh, all his work was going to be done in vain? Shouldn't Nehemiah have known all this stuff? Th that, that it was going to come to nothing? But was it a failure? See, I don't think so. Because eventually Jesus would come. Eventually Jesus would come and shepherd his people. And how would he shepherd his people? How would he shepherd his people? When the people were, were, not, in, 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 they were not their own. They were, they were not their own nation. Eventually Jesus would come. And he would need a landing pad, so to speak. And that was uh, the place to, to serve and the place to minister. And that was to the nation of Israel. And that was in Jerusalem. Was, was, was his work um, a waste? No. When it was prophesied that Jesus would come. It, it was about what he would do to, for the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel first and then to the rest of us as Gentiles. So was it a waste? No. He set it up for, the, for when Jesus would come. And see, that's what your work and my work should be about. It's a setup for when Jesus comes. And we're coming to those days when Jesus is coming again. It may not be what you and I expect. It may not be what you and I consider success. But if we're doing our part in, 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 in God's great eternal plan and purpose, and we're setting up for when Jesus comes, or when... Or, or where we go to him, then where our work is never a success. You know, in, in some ways I can relate to, uh, to Nehemiah, maybe how he was feeling. Many of you know, and I know some of you have said you followed my story on, on Facebook and, and how things were, didn't go the way I thought they were going to and how some things might have been an epic fail. But you know what, during this lesson, God is, has uh, allowed me to go through certain things. That, that I could be even used more effectively for the work of the gospel, for the work that's coming up through Promise LA. And I believe with all my heart that God will launch Promise LA in the city of Los Angeles. And regardless of what I think that looks like, regardless of whether or not my expectations are going to be met, it's not about that. What happens is that we lead people to Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is... Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And without Jesus, there is no peace, no eternal peace. 
Without Jesus, there's no life. And I want to tell you today, that's that's what I have dedicated the rest of my life to, is, is to preaching this gospel. Oh, I know I'm not perfect. And there's times that, that, that my heart and my intentions may sway, and I gotta, and God has to realign me back to the place where I need to be. And praise God for his faithfulness. But what God has in store for me, he, can have in, he has in store for you as well. And God promises success. He says back in Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans that I have for you. Plans for good and not of evil. Plans, plans uh, for good and not of evil. That plans uh, not to harm you, but to bring you to an expected end. That's success, regardless of how we success, see success. See, I learned a long time ago not to compare my success with everybody else. Because comparison will always kill your vision. It always will. And today, as we, we, we finish off a series that was about vision, that's about calling, that's about purpose and seeing that through, I want you to know that success is not about you and I, but it's about the person who has called us. And the Bible says that he who has called us is faithful. But for us to have a purpose, we need to have a relationship. Amen. And we've been talking about that all this series and all actually all that I've preached on this page is to bring you to Jesus Christ. Because he loves you. And he wants to, to spend all of eternity with you. How many of you know that eternity is a long time? He loves you and he wants to spend all eternity with you. And the only way he can do that is by putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Today, if you've never done that, today, if you've never surrendered your life and asked Him to forgive you of your sins, which causes death and, and judgment and condemnation and hell, today, if you have, if you, if you have not asked Him for, to forgive you of your sins, then you can do so today while you still have time. Before the sounding of the trumpet, before the time He comes, you can give you can you can ask him to forgive you of your sins and you can ask him into your life today as Lord and Savior. If you want to do that today, I'm just going to ask you to do one easy thing with me and it's to pray. It's to ask Jesus Christ into your heart as his, as your Lord and as your Savior. And you're like, Pastor Daniel, I don't even know what that means. That's okay. Let's take the first steps and we will little by little we'll share with you what that means. Will you pray with me? Let me lead you into a very short prayer. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I, I confess that I am a sinner, that I've broken all your laws, and I've strayed away from you. I ask you to forgive me and to cleanse me. As I believe you came into the wor this world over 2,000 years ago to die on the cross to pay for my sins. I ask you to wash me clean as snow. And I, because you came out of the grave three days later, because you live, I can live also forever. I ask me to give me your Holy Spirit that I may live the rest of this life for you. And I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you prayed that prayer with me, I know I'm going over time here, but if you prayed that prayer with me, I am going to ask you to um, leave, leave a comment below uh, this video and say, Pastor Daniel, that was me. I prayed with you and I asked Jesus to come into my life. Um, I want to get some material into your hands. I want to get a Bible into your hands. I want to be a resource to you because you're going to have questions. And I want to be here to, to help you in those questions that you may have. Okay? I want to be a resource to you. I want to be able to walk this walk with you uh, as you, you start your walk with Jesus. Amen? And uh, if you need any prayers, please let me know. And um, we want to pray for you. Uh, if if uh, 
putting your comment down on this video and putting it out in public is not your thing, send it to me on Facebook Messenger or you can email me at promiselosangeles at gmail.com. Promiselosangeles at gmail.com. Amen. Thank you all for, for uh, um, joining me here. If you need prayer, if there's something that we need to do for that we can do for you, please do not hesitate to ask. We are here to serve the city, and we want to be here for you. And so, uh, if you need to have any prayer requests, please join us on Thursday nights. If you would like this page, uh, you'll see some announcements of how you can join us uh, online via Zoom in our international prayer meetings. And uh, join us. Uh, we would love to have you. We would love to to pray with you and pray for you. Um, I believe with all my heart that prayer is probably one of the things that we do best here at Promise LA. So God bless you. Again, if there's anything that we could do for you, please let me know and uh, I will do whatever I can to, to be of service to you. Okay, have a safe Labor Day weekend. Enjoy the re rest of your weekend. Be safe, be blessed, and always lift up the name of Jesus. God bless you. Bye-bye.